you know, uh, pro-market policies and their interventionist policies. So pro-market policies, for example, are uh, competitive tax rates. Personal income tax rates are maximum 22-24%, which is a fraction of what you have here in the UK. But even though the government does have subsidies and provision of uh, assistance and medical facilities, uh, individuals get to pick and choose uh, the doctors. If you actually read some of his books, he doesn't believe in that. Mm. Right. The idea is that with more democracy means more dysfunction, more gridlock. Since independence from Malaysia in 1965, Singapore has catapulted from being one of the poorest countries in the world to one of its wealthiest. Meritocracy, personal responsibility uh, and encouraging investment. Lessons from Singapore's economic growth miracle. The newest publication from the Realities of Socialism project explains how that happened. Joining me today is one of its co-authors, Brian Chang, who is also Assistant Director of the Centre of Study of Governance and Society at King's College London. Brian, thank you very much for joining me. Thank you for having me. So explain a little bit what happened to Singapore's economy between 1965 and today, because it's quite a stark picture, isn't it? Indeed. So uh, many things have happened, obviously. It's one of the most successful uh, city-states, successful stories of economic growth in the world. So there are many factors which have contributed to this uh, tremendous growth in, in, in real incomes and living standards. I'll just pick a few. Uh, first and foremost is a strong emphasis on economic growth as, uh, as a policy goal. And this is a zealous pursuit of its leaders since the time of independence until today. And that means that regardless of whether the policies are from the left or the right, whether it's a pro-market policy or an interventionist policy, the focus is always, does it work in terms of generating economic growth, jobs and incomes for people? So it's this pragmatic pursuit of economic growth that I think is driving a lot of the, uh, of the policies and, and, and the experiments of, of the Singapore government. Um, so when I, what I mean is that uh, there is you know, uh, pro-market policies and there are interventionist policies. So pro-market policies, for example, are competitive tax rates. Personal income tax rates are maximum 22-24%, which is a fraction of what you have here in the UK. You have competitive uh, corporation tax, um, minimal regulations, which are not onerous. So you have a very competitive environment for foreign investment, for job creation, wealth creation, and that's always been the case since the 60s until today. At the same time, when it comes to the more interventionist side of things, there's massive government spending on infrastructure, on human capital development, uh, also on industrial policy, as long as they're all working together to create economic growth. I think that's uh, what the Singapore government has been focused on. And so you mentioned some of these policies in regard to tax, uh, but more generally speaking, Singapore is... I think in 2020, it was the freest economy in the world. So beyond tax, how has Singapore's economic policy kind of helped to generate this growth? Because as, as uh, my colleague at the IA, Christian Nemitz, tries to say a lot at the moment, it's not all about tax. That's right. So uh, tax is one thing. Uh, it's also about ensuring there, are, there is meaningful competition in various sectors of the economy. So let's just use, for example, uh, healthcare policy. Uh, even though the government does have subsidies and provision of uh, assistance and medical facilities, uh, individuals get to pick and choose uh, the doctors. They get to pick and choose their insurance plans. They get to pick and choose uh, different hospitals they, they wish to enter or exit from. And this is not the case here uh, in, in the UK. So because of that, there's a high degree of efficiency. Uh, spending on healthcare is a fraction of what it is in most OECD countries. And yet the outcome is disproportionately positive as compared to the amount of spending that's in it. So I would say that that's really one. Ensuring that the monies that are being spent, the resources are being spent, is done in an efficient way with a high degree of competition. That's, um, so, so that's one area. Another area is really reliance on uh, on personal responsibility rather than government welfare. So when we look at uh, income support, when we look at uh, welfare spending, um, you can never get something 
for free entirely. There's always some level of co-payments involved. Uh, even when it comes to uh, medical operations and surgeries, even if there are government subsidies, it will never cover 100% of everything. There's a principle of co-payment. And the idea is that you want to prevent moral hazard. You want to prevent reckless spending and just taking care of yourself. So there's always a, a degree of, of uh, ensuring that the incentives are right. Um, so let me use an example I like to give, which is uh, when it comes to welfare, uh, Singapore calls it workfare, yeah. which is uh, centered around the importance of working. Because we do not want to have a point where, you know, welfare becomes too generous or so easy that it starts to replace the incentive of people to work. So what happens is that uh, if you are a low-income earner, if you are in a low-skilled job, you will have income top-ups in your on your wages and on your uh, what we call the CPF uh, savings. Uh, however, it is conditional upon you finding a job. And if you are unable to find a job, you don't have the right skills, then you'll be subsidized and sent for training and upgrading. So there's a constant emphasis on productivity, lifelong learning, and ensuring your skills are up to date. That's why you, we are helping you to help yourself, as it were, so that you can find a job and can be a productive member of the economy. So there is government provision of welfare, but it's never to the point of replacing the importance of hard work. And that, so, so there are a couple of things in, in what you said there that I'm keen to touch on. One is the workfare yeah. aspect. So in particularly in the United States, but also in a, a few countries in Europe over the years, you have had attempts to kind of change the emphasis of welfare from his cash payment to something that requires a little bit more buy-in from the person who is in receipt of welfare. And it hasn't always worked brilliantly. These things can become very expensive. You don't want to be paying people to dig holes in the ground and fill them up again. Um, and there are a lot of people, you know, a lot of people who who share lots of our our economic views, generally speaking, who say it's better just to give cash. How does Singapore avoid the the pitfalls of workfare in terms of how expensive they are. Um, and, you know, you mentioned stuff like, uh, you know, investment in, in skills rather than kind of paying people to do a job. Is that an important part of it? Absolutely. So I think there are two points to mention. Number one, uh, these supply-side programs in Singapore are definitely very expensive. So there is a natural question, how does Singapore government spend these significant sums of money on human capital, but yet maintain relatively low tax rates? So that then brings us to yet another topic of what we call the national savings of the country, which are invested in national reserves. So Singapore has a lot of extra budgetary sources of revenue, which allows the government to spend without necessarily being limited to taxes. So that's why uh, we talk about, you know, the sovereign wealth funds of Singapore, uh, which have allowed the Singapore government to invest uh, some of the tax revenues and amounts saved so that they can use some of the surplus for these sorts of major projects. So, so that's one part uh, of the question in terms of the uh, expense issue. Um, in terms of avoiding some of the pitfalls, um, it requires a sort of approach to governance where the state is really coordinated across various sectors. So all the different ministries and agencies in Singapore are working together in tandem and there is high levels of trust between government and society. Uh, and a lot of these government programs are also participated in by private universities, polytechnics and companies. So rather than just saying, okay, I, I want to spend 100 million pounds on upgrading skills, the Singapore government is ensuring the buy-in of employers to make sure that employers are supporting this program by sending their workers to skills training. By the same time, that means that the government has to also screen training institutes, universities, and course providers to ensure that the, 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 the courses that are being um, you know, delivered are relevant. You, that means that the government also has to talk to uh, school teachers uh, in high school and university to ensure that students are in the right frame of mind you know, and they are constantly wanting to upgrade themselves. So what I'm describing here is a sort of approach to governance where there is a lot of social engineering involved in different aspects of the Singaporean society in terms of the private sector, the industry associations, parents, students, 
to ensure that different parts of society are working in concert, as it were, does it make sense, to achieve this objective of ensuring lifelong learning. So it's not just, okay, I have 100 million, I just want you to go and do some skills training. No, it's about going to different aspects of society to ensure that different ministries, different institutions are working together for this specific purpose. So, so that's why, you know, that's why people call it state capacity, mm. right? So Singapore government has a lot of the state capacity to ensure that these things can be done in a rather effective way. And yeah. when we, again, a lot of what you've, you've talked about here is that, the, of course, the Singapore government is quite active. We are not, to be clear, talking about some kind of libertarian utopia, oh, not no. by a long stretch. But so some of the things you mentioned there, so lots of government cooperation with the private sector yes. and the higher education system, yes. for example. When that stuff has happened in the UK and when proposals are put forward in the UK for those types of programmes, they are inevitably characterised by dysfunction, by cronyism, and by waste. That's right. Why does it work in Singapore? Or why does it at least appear to work in Singapore? And might Singapore be better off if there was a bit less engagement between government and the private sector? Or is this a case where we can genuinely look at it and say, yeah, in this case, it kind of works. And if so, is it? Can we replicate that in other countries? So there are many aspects to your question. Yeah. Try to answer them. So first of all, we have to understand that Singapore is a rather communitarian society, which is not the case in many Western developed liberal democracies, which are more individualistic. In a communitarian society, people, firms, society, they are willing to uh, make personal sacrifices and go along with the direction of state agents. So that means that... Uh, there's always going to be, of course, some rent-seeking and abuse, but to the extent that people identify with national initiatives and goals, they would be willing to, in a sense, um, not put themselves first, right, and and go along with what the state has, you know, directed for for people. So, so that's one aspect that's not easy to replicate. Um, the other aspect is that the Singapore government is uh, in power for many years. Mm. It's the same party in power. So all this policy making is done with years of time horizon. So when the Singapore government is discussing a human capital investment policy, it's not just to 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 you know see them through the next electoral cycle. It's to ensure that, you know, the population has, you know, uh, the right level of skills and, and resources for the next ten to twenty years. Right? So because of that there isn't a lot of short-term, you know, uh, political interests which could then open the room for rent-seeking mm. and abuse. But there is rent-seeking and there is abuse and that's one of the downsides, which is that because of the generous provision of subsidies, especially for small, medium enterprises, there is actually a culture of rent-seeking uh, in Singapore and that's the negative part mm. where to the extent that small firms are thinking about, you know, getting subsidies that means they are spending less time innovating and developing their products and services. So that's a downside. Mm. But there are all these uh, positive aspects that allow Singapore to seem to be able to do these things in ways that other countries can't. But I fear it's not easily replicable because, as I said, communitarian culture and also an authoritarian political system yes. that allows them to coordinate and bring together all the different actors to conform to their blueprint and and another th another way that you touch on there that Singapore really breaks from the mold is how its political system works. So this is not a liberal democracy, as you it's say. This... Electoral democracy. Yes, and uh, it's I think it's been labelled by quite a few people as kind of a managed democracy, right? Mm -hmm. It's not. Yeah, it's not particularly open democracy. And you also have, you know, it's not. It doesn't rank particularly high on democracy indexes, for example, mm -hmm. um, freedom of the press, freedom of speech, etc. It doesn't tend to rank very highly. Now, one of the uh, one of the the kind of uh, givens of a liberal democracy that tends to make that system much better than any other is that because of the some of the freedoms that come with democracy, like freedom of the press and freedom of speech, because of some of the inbuilt mechanisms of a democracy, i.e., the people can vote you out, mm. that that creates a lot of feedback mechanisms yep. to kind of root out bad ideas within government. That's right, and that's that's sort of the. The, the theory and, and in a lot of ways the empirical fact of why liberal democracies tend to outcompete 
their authoritarian counterparts, whether communist, fascist, or, or whatever else. But S- Singapore isn't a liberal democracy. It lacks those feedback mechanisms. So whereas one advantage might be we can plan for 20, 30 years without worrying about elections, the elections often transmit vital information. So how, in what way does kind of Singapore get around that? Is it because everybody's on the same page to start with? It's a great question. So you talked about the benefits of liberal democracy in mm. terms of competition, generation of feedback and information. Um, from the Singaporean perspective, especially Lee Kuan Yew, if you actually read some of his books, he doesn't believe in that, mm. right? The idea is that with more democracy means more dysfunction, more gridlock, more, you know, discussion. It's a hindrance to him. It's a hindrance to an effective technocratic state having the power to do what is necessary. So it goes, this goes all the way back to Plato, right? So the analogy I like to use is if you are you know, flying on an aeroplane, you definitely do not want to have an election you know, to take votes and see who is most popular and who can therefore fly the aeroplane. You want to allow the most capable individual to be the pilot. So similarly, you know, uh, in Singapore, we believe in a political meritocracy. Yes, of course, it's a democratic election, but it's more of a political meritocracy slash technocracy where we try to hire the most capable individuals. Uh, And that's why a lot of the civil servants and politicians are, you know, top talents uh, from the private sector, engineers, architects, doctors, lawyers. And the assumption is that when you attract these talents, you pay them exceptionally high salaries, then that's how you're able to generate good policies. It's not by having more discussions, more forums, more deliberation, no. It's, it's, it's based on the assumption that intelligence in society is not equally endowed and available. Mm. Some people are just naturally more smart and capable. And that's why we just need to you know, find these people, reward them, put them in government. And that's why I, I want to say one more thing. Mm. It was a controversial policy in the 1980s where Lee Kuan Yew uh, had this thing called the Graduate Mother Scheme where he was uh, having a policy to promote more childbearing um, by couples who had university degrees, right? Because the idea is that if you are university educated, chances are your son and daughter will also be more intelligent. So it's a form of eugenics, sure, right? Uh, It was criticized, it was Mm. not passed, but it does reflect um, the philosophy of governance in Singapore and how that's not so democratic. And but Singapore is not the only country that adopts that type of approach. So you have more democratic countries that are highly meritocratic in their sort of civil service, for example, like South Korea, maybe. But that that approach you just laid out in Singapore about meritocracy and how that kind of sets aside the need for things like liberal democracy. Yeah, it's also a view very widely held in China. And, right. and we saw that for a long time, the Chinese economic plan was going quite well. But right. COVID sort That's of right. revealed the flaws in, in its lack of liberal democracy. Mm. You know, locking down for much longer than the rest of the world, for example, increasingly isolationist. That's right. It's always been an accusation leveled against liberal democracies that, that argument and, and annoying barriers like elections and political dissent are causes of dysfunction. And yet, over the long run, they tend to win. And so we're already seeing in a place like China how some of the lack of liberal democratic institutions are undermining decision making. But it seems like we haven't seen anything like that in Singapore. Is it just that, I don't know, Singapore is just better (laughs) at meritocracy? It it is, you know, it just has had throughout its history the type of people who are just genuinely good at what they do and, and maybe they got lucky. So one thing about maintaining this sort of political meritocratic system is that it really does rely on leaders and specific individuals who do have a sense of public interest and not try to abuse the system, right? So I think the best explanation of it is that, you know, Singapore is is quite a young nation and uh, they have been lucky enough to find uh, leaders to run the machinery of the state who are generally quite, uh, you know, public spirited, right? Um, but the problem is that over time, uh, it's, it's quite hard to find these individuals, and therefore there's an issue of leadership renewal. And as you go down the line, you know, the the sort of talents that people that you have, 
um, be have higher tendency to abuse the system and to engage in and to engage in corruption. So I think uh, the jury is still out, uh, and we need more time, more years, more decades uh, to see what happens uh, down the line in Singapore. But I certainly agree with you. Uh, this is not a perfect policy. In fact, a lot of my research, I think I should mention it for the viewers, so, uh, has always been very critical, actually, of this system. By no means am I defending it and saying it's better than liberal democracy, right? Uh, in fact, one of the, the, the real weaknesses um, is a strong lack of uh, creative innovation. Because in a system where people uh, color within the lines and uh, you know follow the state's blueprints, that's also a system which doesn't promote, uh, you know, creative thinking. And that's why indigenous entrepreneurship, creative culture, creative industries in Singapore is extremely weak. I've documented that in my research. Okay. And so one of the, the final things I want to turn on, which I think is, again, very unique about Singapore, we, we are talking about a country that in so many ways breaks the mould um, that we usually analyse countries through is education. So you yeah. talked about the strong culture of education, how important that is in every aspect of Singapore in life and policy making. Um, it spends, I think, roughly half the average for a highly developed country on education. Um, and yet its outcomes are among the best in the world. Um, you know, if you compare educational outcomes between the UK and Singapore, Singapore streaks ahead. How does that work? Um, so there are many aspects to this. Uh, number one, I would say, is because Singaporeans, in terms of the culture, do place a strong value in education. So even if the government doesn't spend, you know, a lot of public money on it, um, households they will gladly spend a lot of their own money on private tuition, supplementary classes. Um, so because of that, the secondary effect is that there is actually quite a bit of competition, mm -hmm. um, not just between like the official schools, but but also in the private sector when it comes to private tutoring agencies and private educational institutions. Um, so, as, so I think there is a culture of excellence and pursuit of educational uh, achievement uh, amongst the public, which drives a lot of this. And when it comes to uh, the governmental sector, um, it's also tied to what we call the EduSafe account. The EduSafe account is an education savings account, which is part of every individual's central provident fund CPF account, uh, which allows individuals to accrue a portion of their monthly income into this part of savings. And this part of savings can be used to fund medical expenses, can also be used to fund um, educational expenses as well. So that means because it's an available pool of savings, um, you know, individuals are partially to a significant degree uh, re responsible for their own educational expenses and for their own healthcare expenses. And because of the availability of such funds, this reduces the need for high levels of government spending which could become inefficient. Okay. And my final question to you is that we have touched on a few things about Singapore that uh, may not be transferable in other national contexts. But if we ask you now, what lessons can be learned, what key lessons can be learned from Singapore that you think could be transferable, could be replicated in countries in the West where the economy is stagnating like the UK? Um, yeah, what 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 areas can we look at and look over to Singapore for inspiration? So I think principles are universal, but implementation is always local. Mm. So what I would recommend is not specific policies to be transferred, but thinking about the principles that have guided Singapore. So I would say number one, right, is the prioritization of economic growth as an economic policy objective above all else. It's not managing inflation. It's not reducing inequality. It's not, uh, you know, protecting the environment. I'm not saying these are not important, right? They are all important things, but they're all secondary to the objective of economic growth. Because if you do not grow the pie, you have nothing to redistribute. If you do not grow the pie, you do not generate sort of wealth technology that you may need 
in order to have a better and cleaner environment. So economic growth is actually not a problem. It's actually like a, like a Swiss knife, right? Where you know you 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 achieve economic growth and then it unlocks opportunities and resources that you can then use for many other objectives. But looking at the sort of discourse uh, here in the UK, it seems like economic growth is not really a priority. Some people talk a good game yeah. about economic growth, but it's not really something that people are prioritizing. People here, it seems they are more concerned about social justice, right? Uh, you know, rather than growing the pie, right? In Singapore, yes, social justice is important, but that comes after we actually expand economic opportunities for everyone. Because if there is no pie, there is nothing to redistribute. So I would say that is the number one lesson. Excellent. Thank you very much for joining me to talk about this, Brian. Um, and if you enjoyed that video, please uh, remember to give it a like and subscribe to the IA London YouTube channel for more. If you want to find out more about realities of socialism, including the publication that Brian has co-authored, we'll put a few links in the description below. Thank you very much for watching.